Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Welcome to today's podcast. I'm Linda Bregan. I'm a senior attorney with the Environmental Law Institute and a lecturer in law at Vanderbilt University Law School. Today, we're discussing a really thoughtful article by Warren Levy entitled Toolkit for Integrating Climate Change into 10 High Enrollment Law School Courses. This was originally published in 2019 in Lewis and Clark Law School's Environmental Law Review. In his article, he proposes, as the title indicates, that law schools integrate climate change cases um, and other readings into core courses. Um, And he not only provides the specific content for doing that, but an implementation approach as well. Before I introduce our guest, I want to introduce the three stellar Vanderbilt University law students who are here with me today participating in the podcast. We have third year law student Brian Davidson, and he is the editor in chief of the Environmental Law and Policy Annual Review, which you're going to learn more about in just a few minutes. And also with us are second year law students, Catherine Denny and Bruce Johnson. And they will be asking our guests some really uh, interesting questions that they developed on their own. So let me now introduce our guest, Warren Levy. He is an adjunct associate professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he teaches in the College of Law, in the Campus Honors Program, and in the Department of Geography. He also has taught at the Washington University School of Law, University of Birmingham, and that's England School of Law, and the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health. Earlier in his career, he was a partner and practice group leader at Skadden Arps, Slate, Meagher, and Flom, LLP, and he also served as senior staff at the Federal Communications Commission. Professor Levy works on climate change and other environmental projects with the World Commission on Environmental Law, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and the Sierra Club. He earned his JD, MS, and BA degrees from Harvard University and a diploma in economics from Cambridge University. Um, Before we jump into our discussion with Professor Levy, I want to hand it over to Brian Davidson to tell you a little bit about how we picked this article to discuss today as part of the Environmental um, Law and Policy Annual Review class. So I'd like to hand it over now to Brian. All right. Thank you, Professor Bregan, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Brian Davidson, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Environmental Law and Policy Annual Review. Um, LPAR is a joint publication created by Vanderbilt Law School in the Environmental Law Institute. In this publication, we identified the year's best legal and policy solutions in academic literature to pressing environmental issues. LPAR also organizes annual conferences in D.C. and Nashville, where the authors of the selected articles present their research and discuss it with other experts in the field. LPAR has three goals. First, We take ideas from the legal academy and distribute them among policymakers and practitioners. Second, we encourage academics to engage in scholarship that contains practical proposals. And lastly, we highlight scholarship that is feasible, creative, persuasive, and impactful. The 22 students in the LPAR class select the articles over the course of a semester with input from their instructors, ELI staff, and an advisory committee of senior environmental attorneys from the public and private sectors. For more information about our process and this year's picks, please check out our ELI and Vanderbilt LPAR webpages online. Uh, And with that, I think we will start the discussion with Professor Levy. Uh, Professor, thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, I I will start things off with, do you mind briefly describing the overall thesis behind uh, the proposals in your article? Sure, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm glad to be able to talk with you and your other students. Uh, The thesis is that climate change needs to be part of educating law students, not so they can just understand the science of climate change, but rather so they could understand how to practice law under conditions that are affected by climate change. And in order to do that, it's best to integrate climate change cases, programs, laws, and other materials into the basic courses that all law students take. All right, thank you, Professor. Um, 
was there a specific moment or event that inspired you to write an article addressing the climate competency shortfall in contemporary legal education? Sure, really four events. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, during your first semester at Vanderbilt Law School, did climate change come up in any of your courses as you were learning the fundamental legal principles? Uh, you know, honestly, I could say I, I'm not sure that climate change uh, was ever mentioned. Uh, okay. Directly. And yeah, second question. You know, I'm thrilled that you have such a strong interest in environmental law. About what percentage of the Vanderbilt Law School class is taking environmental law classes? Ooh, um, I would say roughly 10 to 15 percent. Right, right. Okay, roughly. and last question, just quick. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you or anyone in your family or close friends are suffering from asthma or allergies or are having a worsening of these conditions that you've been experiencing? Um, that I could contribute to climate change? Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not sure. I have not really, I haven't really thought about it. Yeah. Nothing yeah. I'm aware okay. of. That's honest. You know, look, I'm glad that you're enjoying good health and, you know, especially during these times. Um, but, you know, those are three of the topics that brought me to this approach. The first is that, uh, when I spoke with students at the University of Illinois Law School, so many of them were really not hearing about climate change in any of their classes, and certainly not in the first semester, you know, to gain an interest in pursuing further understanding of how climate change impacts the practice of law and how they need to have understandings and skills relating to climate change. Second, you know, the experience here at University of Illinois Law School is, is like what you said, maybe 10 or 15% of the students will take environmental law classes. And you've got some under, we have wonderful law professors in environmental law, we do also. And uh, you know, I taught you know, two courses uh, in, at the uh, University of Illinois Law School and, and you know, I had very good students, you know, a lot of interest, you know, but it, it just wasn't reaching so many of the students and, and basically you know if a student you know during the first year decides that uh, she or he is going to pursue bankruptcy law or uh, insurance law or you know litigation you know they're not going to waste their time you know in taking environmental law and then they'll never understand that there's a connection you know between certain fundamental understandings in environmental law or climate change and what they need to do to practice even in specialties that are not like environmental law or energy law. Uh, the third is, you know, as I, I mentioned to Linda, you know, my wife and I co-teach courses. Um, she's in the College of Medicine and was program director for internal medicine residency here. And as I was working with her and her students, trying to help them understand how climate change impacts practicing medicine, you know, which it really does you know, uh, in all areas of specialty. Um, you know, I realized that law students you know, were missing out on this, right? And uh, you know, in the medical field, I, I think that there's been more work on curriculum planning on related to climate change than for law. And, the, and there are all kinds of different ways of, of giving some basic competency, you know, maybe a one hour grand rounds lecture or a special workshop, you know, and such. But really, you know, where so many different uh, experts on medical education are coming out is that there's gotta be an integration of climate change into all of the classes and all of the rotations or specialties. And then the fourth is just my own, you know, life experience. Um, I have, uh, well, practiced law for, you know, well, I guess 40 years. Um, and I've worked in a number of fields where technology was changing or legal models were changing um, and, uh, or legal frameworks. And the, the lawyers who didn't have a background 
you know, uh, often struggle. Okay, and lawyers are smart. They need to learn on a job. They need to be lifelong learners and such. But on the other hand, you know, as I went through different areas, uh, you know, I started off late 1970s when there was no field of computer law. And now you have information technology laws. But so many lawyers back then who had to deal with acquisitions of computer hardware or software or services had really no idea of what they were dealing with in terms of risks and opportunities for their clients. And then, you know, as I kind of progressed, um, the communications industries were transformed by regulatory models that focused on competition and by changes in technology. You know, again, you know, a lot of lawyers who were practicing in the 60s and 70s before the Federal Communications Commission, you know, knew how to do hearings before administrative law judges uh, on broadcast license renewal, but they really weren't in a position to deal with competition issues for telecom services or interconnection and such. And, well, the examples go on and on. Okay, so that's that's my answer to your question. All right, thank you, Professor. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine Denny. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Professor Lady, for joining us here today. I'm excited to talk with you about your article. Um, my first question has to do with imparting the basic scientific concepts underlying client change to law students. Um, do you think law schools should provide this basic knowledge in some format? And if so, what is the most efficient and impactful way to do so? Okay, so uh, I do not spend much time in my classes uh, on the basic science. I assign it, you know, as a reading for uh, the, uh, the first class, um, but then, you know, don't really, you know, spend hours kind of going through greenhouse gas effects and source of emission and, you know, ways of drawing down atmospheric carbon and, and such. Uh, I know that some other law professors who I have a lot of respect for you know, feel that, you know, spending two weeks on basic climate science is important. You know, but, you know, for law students as well as for undergraduates, you know, I uh, do assign a reading or two to give them some videos to watch. And then I try to let them learn more, you know, through uh, cases or agency decisions or reports, you know, that do a pretty good job of covering, you know, the climate science. Thank you. Um, my second question kind of still has to do with the classroom setting, more specifically geared though towards how in the current political climate, climate change is unfortunately a controversial topic and law students likely have disparate views on the issue. While the core suggestions you make ground the issue in legal precedent, students could still be distracted from the broader pedagogical goals of in particular core classes. Would you have suggestions for ways that professors can avoid this distraction? All right, so what do you think? I know there are some other social issues that have kind of emerged in my, I'm thinking back to my first semester of 1L, and I know myself, I think I brought one up in class and the professor did a good job of acknowledging my feelings on it while also kind of moving us through. So I imagine that would be the same kind of approach that a professor might need to take. Um, but I wasn't sure just because in this instance, we are trying to more deeply engage with the material as opposed to that was kind of a one-off situation that maybe wasn't as pertinent. Right. So um, that's a very good response. I'm glad you feel that way. Um, you know, my view, you know, I, I could just start off by saying it, it's very unfortunate that uh, climate change is viewed as a, a political hot button. You know, the science is very solid and the threats are real, you know, not just, you know, 50 years from now, but today. Um, you know, in terms of law courses, uh, you know, I really feel that all law students need to be engaged in understanding that conditions are changing. Okay, so, you know, whether they need to view it 
in terms of uh, you know, currently hot political proposals on programs, you know, like a green recovery from the COVID economic uh, recession, or uh, you know, whether a carbon tax is fair or whatever. I think that they do need to understand that the conditions are changing and that you know, their practice of law requires them to advise clients in the context of these changing conditions. And to say that, well, we, we won't call it climate change or we won't teach it you know, because there is a political controversy really means that the students are going to emerge from law school and not have some of the competencies that their clients need. And I'll just refer you to a resolution that was adopted by the American Bar Association in August of 2019 that urged lawyers to advise their clients of the risks and opportunities that climate change provides. And it's not you know, just advising their clients of a particular political persuasion or in particular states or in even in particular industries. I mean, this is really a direction to all lawyers, not just environmental lawyers or lawyers that call themselves climate specialists, but all lawyers should have the ability to advise clients on things like contractual provisions in light of threats to global supply chains or what it means to have you know insurance coverage when floodplains are changing when drought conditions are changing when heat conditions are changing and such um and uh you know, it, the, you know the examples go on and on securities disclosures for corporations you know you know, diligence for mergers and acquisitions. All lawyers need to have the competency to advise their, their clients on the kinds of risks and opportunities that are connected to climate change. And, you know, this, this shouldn't be a political issue. So I guess that, you know, the short answer is that if a professor feels that uh, it's necessary to avoid turning people off or engaging in a political free for all, um, you know, then, you know, let's steer it to particular conditions, uh, you know, like sea level rise or flooding or, you know, wildfires or whatever. But, you know, make the students aware that the conditions are changing. Thank you. That, that sounds like an excellent resolution to deal with it. I'm actually going to go ahead. That was my second question. I pass off to Bruce and he's going to ask you a few more questions. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Professor Levy. Thanks again for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to start off with just kind of some general questions about the article, and then I have one kind of more content specific about some of your particular proposals. So, so what do you think about encouraging schools to require an environmental law class rather than amending the curriculum of core classes? Um, do you think maybe this would be less effective because it fails to... Okay, so um, I, I'm supportive of... Uh, yeah, I'm supportive of broad training on environmental law across, um, you know, all students. You know, if a school, uh, you know, could develop environmental law as a mandatory course, you know, that would be great. Yeah, you know, I'll just say that um, uh, four years ago, the uh, International Union for Conservation of, of Nature and the World Commission on Environmental Law recommended that uh, environmental legal education and capacity building, you know, be developed for all people, you know, not just for lawyers. So having all lawyers, you know, come out with an understanding of environmental law frameworks and you know areas of substantive law the different federal and state jurisdictions yeah you know, all that's very valuable um the 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 typical response that you know i was getting for law curriculum as well as in medical curriculum engineering and other subjects you know is that there are already so many areas that our students you know need to learn if it's not going to be tested on the bar exam 
then um, you know it's really hard for us to uh, put that in as a mandatory uh, part of our curriculum. So uh, yeah, that's really you know where you know this idea of okay, fine, you know let's look at the legal competencies that you are already targeting for development and recognize that the same time that is devoted in curriculum to develop those competencies, instead of using cases on railroads from 120 years ago, you know, use a case on you know, some you know, uh, more contemporary uh, uh, set of facts you know, where you can also talk about uh, climate change. And uh, you know, it's, it's kind of unfortunate you know, that we're getting to the point where there's an abundance of climate-related cases, you know, that can be used to teach virtually every basic legal competency. Great, thank you. Yeah, just to kind of throw in my personal experience, a little follow-up on that question, I'm taking an environmental law class, and I think it's just tremendous to kind of learn about all the statutes and everything, but I think what you're really getting at is kind of just emphasizing this link between climate change and all the other types of law. And it seems like to do that, maybe it's most effective to, instead of having a mandatory class, to just implement it across the spectrum. Right, and you know, I can also tell you about what you have coming ahead of you in terms of the bar exam. I mean, you're gonna end up taking a bar review course and learning stuff that uh, you know you know, will not be part of uh, practicing law uh, for for your own career. And whether it's some, you know, rule against perpetuities or some aspect of civil procedure or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, you, you're going to be told that, well, there's going to be a question on this on the bar exam. Just learn it and it's fine to forget it the next day. You know, so what I'm talking about is really very different from that. I'm not saying take an environmental law course because your school tells you you got to take it and forget it because you're going to become, you know, a securities lawyer or you're going to become a real estate lawyer or whatever. What I'm saying is that there's got to be a, um, a connection between practicing law in all of these areas and understanding climate change or advising clients on the risks and opportunities associated with climate change. So, you know, having a dedicated course is great, but I still think that, you know, when you hear from a securities lawyer about disclosures, there should be some recognition that, boy, you know, we're having, that, that the regulators, uh, companies, uh, industry groups and others are really struggling, you know, with what to disclose, you know, in terms of climate change on uh, costs and opportunities and strategies for the for the business. It's a fascinating subject and it's a great way to learn about you know securities laws. So um, you know, I don't want to pass up on an opportunity to get you know more students to learn environmental law and, I, and I'm glad that you're taking a course. Yeah thank you. So you kind of touched on this a few minutes ago when you were like Casebook authors love to use railroad cases and old ones. And it seems like maybe that's a little bit of a barrier to kind of implementing environmental law more into the curriculum and other classes. So do you have any suggestions on how to kind of encourage casebook authors to integrate some of these suggested cases into their books? Yeah, so um, there's some wonderful casebooks out there and you know, very talented, authors or groups of authors who are putting together cases and, and trying to get multiple perspectives, you know, so economic analysis is much more of a part of law cases now than it was when I was in law school. Um, we, what we're running into is, is uh, you know, two things. One is, you know, a uh, lack of readily available materials. And, um, yeah, that's really why I put together this toolkit article. And um, I started down the path of developing a website, you know, where the materials you know, would be available. So you could actually access, you know, uh, not only uh, 
selections from cases, but you know some background materials and videos and make it engaging and, and whatever. So that's one route to go. Um, and you know I've a, a, approached some publishers and, and authors, but you know frankly, I haven't gotten very far with that. Yeah, you know, the, the second thing that we're running into is the same as what you know I've seen for years, you know, through you know my wife in you know the medical profession. And that, and that is that you know, since climate change wasn't a part of how your professors were trained in law school, and since you know your professors probably are not in actively engaged in practicing law now you know maybe they were clerks for two or three years you know 10 years ago maybe 30 years ago whatever and they got a limited range of case experience now you know again there's some brilliant law professors you're getting you know uh, you know great experiences by learning from them yeah you know, but they just don't have the pr perspective you know that climate change is affecting so many different areas of law you know so somebody could go out and teach you know securities law or they could you know teach uh tax law and really not get into uh, these uh, areas and and um uh you know I, I think part of the answer is to bring in um uh, whether it's professors or practitioners with an environmental law focus who do see the connections to other areas of law. So you know, I was in a big law firm uh, and you know, I was brought in as a special specialist you know, by people working on a wide variety of mergers and acquisitions and bankruptcy proceedings and litigation and others you know, that you know, um, connected with my area of expertise, right? So I would think that if you bring in uh, environmental law practitioners from from major firms, they will be able to add, you know, some of this um, substance and, and perspective to what uh, professors teach, you know, based on textbooks. And and hopefully it'll all go together. Nice. Um, so another thing that you kind of touched on briefly before with Catherine's question about climate change maybe being a hot button issue, unfortunate as that may be. Um, what do you maybe suggest as a solution from a professor who does not want to integrate climate change topics into their classes, maybe because they don't think it's important or maybe even they don't think it's real because they already feel like they, they barely have enough time to get through what they're trying to get through already. I've kind of noticed my professors are always kind of rushing to, to not fall behind. So how do, we, how do we make room for this and prioritize it? All right, so uh, yeah, let me ask you. I mean, you know, and it's something that I ask my students also. You know, in um, have you seen uh, subject matters or, or cases or, or particular legal principles that your professors presented to you? You know, where you thought, boy, that was an opportunity to talk about climate change, and we just didn't go that direction. So while you're thinking about that, let me just say that you know, I teach a campus honors program course, and it's for undergraduates. And I get undergraduates, you know, throughout the uh, university, you know, majoring in uh, music or chemistry or computer science or whatever. And I ask them this question in, the, in the, the first class, you know, introduce yourself, tell me where you're from, tell me what you're majoring in, and then think about, you know, whether climate change has come up as part of your classes or could have come up. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, you know students like in, in civil engineering, you know, we'll say, well, yeah, our professors did talk about, you know, how we have to think about, you know, uh, stormwater, you know, in, in, you know, intense rains or sea level rise. Um, uh, but a lot of times, you know, the students won't make the connection, at least not in the first class, but by the 10th class or so, they will. You know, I had, you know, an outstanding student in, in computer science who thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm learning algorithms, I'm learning artificial intelligence. Of course, you know, you know, climate change never comes up. But then we talked, you know, uh, about, you know, the role of sensors and of, um, uh, you know, modeling and, you know, other, you know, uh, aspects of, of uh, computer science that are, that are really integral to how society is approaching climate change. All right, so with that, you know, I, I 
I gave you a couple minutes, so you know, let me just ask you, you know, have you seen ways that your professors could have integrated climate change into what they were teaching? Yes, I, I thought of a few, actually. Um, oh, I great. Mean, I thought if I gave you enough time, you could get the right answer. All right, good, go. Yeah. Um, so I'll just go back to the two of the 1L fall classes here at Vanderbilt. So thinking about contracts, you know, we talked about kind of force majeure provisions and kind of, you know, when what can make a contract conditions come up that no one would expect initially. And I think that would have been a great time to talk about climate change, increasing the levels of natural disasters, stuff along those lines. Also, I'm thinking about torts a little bit, like toxic torts. One of the things that got me most interested in coming to law school is reading about some of the great class action suits that have been brought up, whether it's like Tom's River or something along those lines. So I was a little, although I love my torts professor, maybe I was a little disappointed to not have that be a subject of discussion. And you could say the same thing about civil procedure and, and uh, class actions as well. Yeah, so I, I you know, th so that's great. And I really think it's up to students like you or Brian or Catherine and professors you know, like Linda who, who do have a real interest in environmental issues and you know, are probably you know, getting some news feeds or looking at cases or whatever you know, that are showing you that there's a lot going on in, uh, in climate change and, and then bringing it to the attention of professors who are teaching you know, these other courses. You know, for example, you know, I end up seeing uh, developments in securities law relating to climate change that, you know, I bring forward to a professor here at, at Illinois Law School um, in securities law. And, and she's very nice. We've had wonderful conversations, but, but normally she would miss this, right? You know, it might be a case that's, you know, really not labeled as a major securities case, or it's something in a district court, you know, that, you know, was really interesting and could be used. And uh, there's no reason to limit, you know, what is being taught to, you know, Supreme Court cases or something. Yeah, but it, it, it's really up to us, you know, people who kind of want more and see what the challenges are, you know, to, you know, show the other professors that the materials are there, they could be used to teach the same competencies, and in fact, the law is moving such that, you know, for students to complete this course, they really should be hearing something about how this type of practice is being affected by climate change. Nice. And just one more question, and this is a little bit more specific about uh, one of the classes you spoke about, property specifically. So you touch on takings and easements being an insightful way to kind of integrate climate change topics into property law, which is something we did a little bit in my property class with the cases like Lucas versus South Carolina. Um, and I've noticed at Vanderbilt, at least, there's a pretty strong trend for property professors to have an interest in environmental law. Um, so I think maybe this could be a class where the climate change issues are really honed in on. Could you maybe elaborate on some of your proposals to be integrated in a property class or maybe make some further suggestions that you didn't suggest in the article? Sure. Uh, well, I'm glad that you kind of made the connection uh, you know, between the Lucas case and uh, climate change. Um, I think property law is really ripe for uh, teaching uh, the basic competencies, you know, with climate change. So, you know, whether it's issues like takings or zoning, uh, economic regulation, uh, whatever, you know, that um, there's there's such a, a an overlap and and uh, so many areas of land use they are being affected by climate change. You know, tens of millions of acres in this country are being devoted to growing uh, feedstock for biofuels. Well, you know, biofuels, I guess, you know, some of the support, you know, came from energy independence concerns and such, but some of the support, at least initially, was that this is a way of decreasing greenhouse gas emissions. Now, you know, there's still a hope that advanced 
uh, biofuels will do so. Um, similarly, you know, there are hundreds of millions of dollars a year that are coming out of the carbon market in California, you know, to support forests around the country as, you know, carbon sinks, you know, offsets or carbon sequestration. And, you know, in at least a half dozen states, the um, environmental impact statements that must be filed for major land use developments you know, must include consideration of the impacts on greenhouse gas emissions. You know, so, uh, you know, and then, you know, solar and wind, you know, is, you know, uh, affecting agricultural lands. It's affecting, you know, land in, in, in rooftop uses in urban areas and, and in just so many other ways. So um, uh, beach erosion, you know, is important and, you know, it, the Lucas case can be taught for you know, the principle as to economic regulation and takings, you know, which is great and it applies broadly, you know, not just to um, uh, regulation you know, to protect beaches. Yeah, but I, I think that, you know, well, I agree with you, that, that it is an opportunity to talk about climate change and how uh, yeah, concerns about erosion, you know, are affecting everything from, you know, how um, uh, flood insurance works and whether uh, people should be paid to build back in areas that are repeatedly subject to flooding, you know, to uh, uh, development of uh, wetlands as a way of, of uh, lessening, you know, the impacts of storms and, um, you know, through uh, liability for the Army Corps of Engineers in terms of managing some flooding situations. So yeah, property is is really a you know, great class to do this in. Yeah, as someone who came into law school wanting to do environmental law, property was a class I was most excited for and it was great, but I think you're right, there's a lot more that can be done there. Um, so that's it for me on questions, but I'm gonna pass it back to Catherine for one final question. Hello again. I'm going to reiterate, I also enjoyed my property class. It was the one class that I actually felt like touched on climate change issues. Um, but there, for right. coursework that less clearly has case law that is a good representative for students to engage with, I kind of thought of securities law. Do you have recommendations for how professors can incorporate climate change material into their curriculum in a way that's grounded? Um, and will stick with students more clearly, given that a lot of coursework is kind of centered on case law and that's how students remember it. Right. Well, um, there are case decisions, you know, including recently out of, uh, you know, New York on, you know, whether ExxonMobil uh, disclosed uh, climate risks in its securities filings or engaged in fraudulent misrepresentations that were inconsistent with what its own uh, scientists you know, and uh, business planners were looking at. Uh, there are uh, reports from you know, major securities regulators around the world you know, that uh, require uh, companies to address uh, climate change and provide guidance on you know, how that should be handled. Um, there is a uh, recommendation or guidance from the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission in 2010 uh, on uh, climate change disclosures that look at not just the physical uh, risks, you know, like facilities that might be affected by uh, flooding you know, with sea level rise or storms, you know, but also uh, business risks, uh, interruption of supply change, you know, new opportunities as laws change and create uh, markets for you know, electric vehicle batteries or for um, uh, uh, you know, more efficient uh, uh, 
you know, appliances or whatever. And then also the reputational issues, you know, that come in connection with climate change. You know, if, you know, companies are kind of targeted by environmental groups and say, you know, because they're, they're not doing enough to cut down on you know, deforestation in Brazil or Indonesia in connection with, you know, the wood products or, you know, soy uh, oils that they are using in their, in their products and such. You know, th there could be reputational damage and that can affect the company. So, you know, I, th I think that there are plenty of very concrete, you know, materials um, that could be used in uh, securities law courses. And, you know, I've, I've proposed, you know, some of these in, in you know, the article and, and I'm happy, you know, to send you more. Um, and, um, you know, I guess I could also say that, you know, companies are adopting um, sustainability plans or, you know, more, you know, generally uh, ESG, you know, uh, environmental, social, and governance uh, commitments. And uh, these are often coordinated through the legal department, but they're outside of securities filings. And what ends up in securities filings and is reviewed by securities regulators and uh, subject to the possible liability, you know, with, in connection with securities filings versus what is done outside of securities filings through separate reports or websites or whatever that try to, uh, you know, portray the company's uh, sustainability commitments. You know, th that's a very interesting area for, you know, securities law. And I think students could, uh, you know, pick up, you know, a sustainability plan from one of hundreds of different, you know, US or global companies, or say a couple of different companies in the same industry and compare them. You know, what are they saying to their investors, you know, and how are they reporting their, their um, uh, targets and their achievements? Thank you. No, that I know in some of my classes there's more of a policy focus where they do ask us to engage with it in that way, where we think about what's the best policy in those situations. So I agree that is a good way to approach it, and it's very interesting. And I'm excited to see it kind of pop up in my classes more. But that's my yeah, last and, question. So, so <laughs> you know, reading cases is great, but you know, in terms of what you do in class, I often try to have active learning exercises and put students in the position where, all right, you're general counsel of this kind of company. And uh, you're told that uh, uh, the uh, securities regulators or your large investors, uh, you know, uh, uh, want to see disclosures, you know, in connection with climate change. Uh, put together a draft of how you're going to, you know, deal with these items, or at least, you know, develop a working plan for how you're going to get your finance people together with your operations people together with your, you know, risk uh, management people and whatever, you know, to, you know, develop the drafts. And, you know, I worked on securities filings part-time for over 20 years. And uh, securities lawyers are great at taking last year's disclosure uh, and marking it up, you know, to reflect, you know, some changes in the business and, you know, different levels of revenues, and expenses, or whatever. They're not very good, or they're pretty intimidated by drafting whole new sections, you know, like a section that's going to address climate change for the first time. You know, so to put students in a securities law class into that kind of exercise, I think is really valuable. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to uh, interject here because we're we're running out of time, but I, I certainly feel like you you've made your case, and I, I have to um, ask. I can't um, can't resist just closing with this question, which is, um, 
is there any indication that your proposal is gaining traction among law professors and practitioners? And, and then perhaps on a more upbeat note, did you ever contemplate the role that students could play in promoting this idea as they are today? Because I can tell you that they were the motivating force for this podcast, right? They, uh, it really resonated with them. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you have thought about that before and um, just how you imagine implementation moving forward. Right. So uh, the answer to your first question is uh, that it's gained some traction, but I wouldn't say, you know, it's exponential growth. It's taking off like a rocket or whatever. I mean, you know, it's, it's in the early stages and, uh, you know, I would love to see Vanderbilt uh, and other yeah. podcast listeners really take this up. And I'm happy to help in any way uh, do that. You know, I have taught some of these topics in, as part of an environmental law clinic where you know the students worked on projects for clients but in class you know i also said all right here's how we're going to do a securities you know case or here's how we're going to do a, a real property development case or whatever yeah you know, i've also taught you know one class as part of an overall property class that had you know uh, focus on on climate change um, you know, in terms of the role of students, I think it's really critical. I, you know, I think that you know students have got to uh, kind of make administrators aware that they want to want this competency. And you know, there's a wonderful <laughs> article that, that came out uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, on medical students in Emory University's uh, School of Medicine that that are really pushing for more climate change in their curriculum. Uh, and uh, I could also, you know, give you uh, an instance. You know, again, I work with my wife, you know, who's uh, involved in various medical societies. So she had a resolution that climate change should be part of medical education, and it was before the Illinois State Medical Society. And you know, various practitioners, you know, especially the elderly ones, you know, didn't want any part of this. You know, they said, look, we just, we practice medicine. We don't want, you know, it's too political. It's, it's, you know, well, I, you know, I, other, other adjectives and, and, you know, but, but one you know, medical student, you know, got up and he said that, look, he just studied for his national boards and there was a, so much to learn. He doesn't want to come off and say that anything more should be in the curriculum. On the other hand, he has asthma, he knows it's getting worse, and that it's getting worse in part because climate change and what's that doing to air quality and, you know, here and around the world. And, and he feels that, you know, it's his medical education should include, mm -hmm. you know, climate change in terms mm -hmm. of respiratory, cardiovascular, renal, infectious diseases, and other areas. So, yes, you know, uh, students are a great hope. <laughs> and I'm going to stop right there because that is the sentence that we want to end on. Students are our great hope. And uh, really, thank you all for joining us today. Obviously, a special thanks to Professor Levy and our Vanderbilt Law students, Brian Davidson and Catherine Denny and Bruce Johnson. I think this is the first ELI podcast in which our guest has turned the tables and asked questions of the interviewer. So you all handled it beautifully. And uh, listeners, we hope you will listen to more ELI LPAR podcasts, participate in our LPAR conferences, and read our annual publication. All of the information is available both on the ELI website and the Vanderbilt Law School website. So thank you so much um, for joining us today. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at ELI.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.